You've been in sales quite a while, even as a kid in high school, right? Yeah, off and on since I was 16, I started selling plasma TVs at Best Buy, you know, non commissioned just hourly and a few, um, you know, few little stays with different cell phone companies and whatnot, and other sales positions. You know. Okay. So you got into sales early on. Um, after you got out of high school, maybe if you went to college, what type of sales did you get into? Uh, so the after high school would have been just uh, team, like, you know, working for big, the big cell phone companies and that kind of stuff and just really doing kind of, kind of poorly or just kind of average. It's so you're in your mid thirties. So you got into cell phone sales, what, like 2008, 2010, 2012? Yeah, it would be like my junior year in high school is when I started. Okay. And then when you got into sales as a cell phone salesperson, like what type of sales training did you go through? Well, they give you a version of a 10 step type generic you know, program. Um, you know, I was in some of those instances, I was the guy in the middle of the mall that annoys the hell out of you, you know, as you walk by. So it doesn't get off to a good start immediately. And you don't pretty much figure out what the customer is doing or what they like. You're just trying to throw your product and just cram it down their throat. Basically. You're like one of those uh, guys, you know, at the, at the little uh, um, outdoor stuff in like Tijuana, Mexico, that just like, you know, throws stuff products in your yeah. face and tries to get some money from you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So then you got out of out of selling cell phones. And what did you what did you get into as far as your sales career? So in that um, I had a little bit of a stay in procurement and a desk job. And then when COVID happened, uh, there were some layoffs, unfortunately, which turned out to be a really good thing in, the, in, in hindsight. Um, I did a stay with a little while for a plumbing company and, and a really great job. And I had a great desk with a great view. And I just decided it wasn't for me. Um, so that's when I really started going. That was an inside sales job, just making about, you know, 50 to 60,000 a year. Um, and then I tried a, a gutter company that, you know, was pretty successful, but um, wasn't a good fit. And then I got with my current company now, November of last year. So, okay. So we're talking, what, eight months ago, seven yeah. months ago. Okay. What do, what do you sell now? What industry are you in? So I'm in remodeling in home, first call warm leads, uh, first call close. And I do a mainly shower conversions and bathroom remodeling. Uh, secondary, I sell windows and then entry doors. Okay. So it's bathroom remodeling. Basically, do you, I'm assuming because we train a lot of companies in your space as well, but especially home improvement in general, like kitchen repair and siding and all that kind of stuff. However, with and we have a big account that I know that comes in. So you guys come in with the bathroom stuff, and when somebody's elderly, right? Yeah. You know, they could fall in a regular shower bathtub. So you putting these like safety measures in the bathtub to really pre help prevent that, right? Correct. They just transform a bathtub shower into a walk-in shower, or just really it doesn't have to be just accessibility. Any updates they want to a shower, but the majority is probably due to mobility issues. Okay. All right. So you're solving problems, right? If these people don't purchase what you're offering, there could be some serious consequences as they get older. Correct. Okay. All right. So, so walk me through, um, before you got into any PQ, so just go, act like you don't know anything now. So we're sure. saying like, you know, last September, last October, how were you taught how to sell? Like when you, because with in your industry, for the most part, you get inbound leads, you have an appointment, you go over to their home. And, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, well, inbound leads, that's really easy. Well, typically, they're also getting quotes from four or five other companies at the same time. So there's a lot of competition. It's not like you're the only person coming over the home. The average person is probably getting two or three quotes, right, from other companies. Right. So it, it's not as easy as what some people would think you have to you have to learn advanced skills just like every industry has its you know positives and negatives and that's a positive and that's a negative so when you go into the home how are you really taught how to really connect with the prospect before you learned any pq so before any pq and when you go into a home it was really part of a 10-step process where you call it, step process yeah, you you call it the first step to answer your question to really connect with the client is the fluff you throw out you know you look around you try to see if they're a fisherman like i am or like you try to relate with them with some fluff that okay, everybody you're, else taught, you're taught to look around at the pictures uh, ask them how their day's going, you know, right. who won the game last night. Oh, I like to fish too. So you were taught how to ask that, but how, typically 
how would most people react to you when you would do that? Um, you know, it, it depends on the person. If they're more extroverted, they try to kind of like, you know, be polite with you. But for the most part, I mean, it it's just kind of like filler. They're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, OK, you know, or they'll you know, if you're really good at it, they'll get into it for a minute. But then they kind of shut you down and just kind of like, OK, let's move on. Like, for what why, you're do you think, why do you think they shut you down? Uh, probably because every single person that comes in there is doing the exact same thing. Yeah. So every salesperson that's ever tried to sell them anything, whether right. they've come to their house, whether they've called on the phone, whether they've cold called, whether they've been in Best Buy, whether they've been anywhere, is also saying the same damn thing. How are you doing today? Look, I want to make sure everybody understands. When you sound like every other salesperson has ever tried to sell this prospect something, what do you think psychologically is going through your prospect's mind in the first 30 seconds? They're labeling you like every other salesperson. They are literally, you are triggering them just by asking that question that everybody asks them. You are triggering them where the walls of resistance immediately go up. They basically, you might as well write salesperson on your forehead and they're going to push you off to the side and deal with you and commoditize you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, since you've learned NEPQ, how, what's one good connecting question that we've taught you? I'm not going to have you give all connecting questions we've taught you, but what's going, one good connecting question we've taught you, and then how do your prospects now respond to, to that way of opening them up? Yeah, so right after I do the uh, disarming statement, when I walk inside just saying, hey, I don't know if I can help you or not, um, you know, we kind of sit down at the table or, or whatnot, and my connecting question is it's semi-connecting, maybe a little bit situational, but it does two things, really. Um, I want to know what number bid I am when I go in there, and then I want to know if they've seen any product of their education or you know level. So my question is, um, so before, before you guys had me out here today, um, ha have you been out there and have you seen any product or have you been shown any product that you actually like? Why do you do that? Tell us why you do that. Yeah. So um, number one, I wanted to see where I am if, if in a bid process in my industry that everybody kind of wants to get three bids type thing. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is I want to gauge their education level and I want to see if they've been shown something that they like or not. Okay. And then I'm going to go, OK, well, what do you like or dislike about that? Okay. Um, so I know what's important to cover later on in my process and yeah. what amount of detail I need to really go into with this client. Yeah. Walk, walk us through for, you said something uh, earlier that I, I think might help everybody watching. Uh, you said that we've taught you how to disarm them. Oh but yeah. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Give us an example. Yeah. So when I knock on the door, this has been probably one of the most powerful things that I do. I see body language change like immediately. Um, I knock on the door and I uh, say, hey, you know, it's just Matt with XYZ company. Um, I understand that you guys are possibly thinking about making some changes. Is it to a shower like that? And then you get one or two responses. They immediately say, oh, no, we're not thinking about it. We're going to do something. Yeah. Or you, you get the person that's just going, yeah, you know, I'm just kind of collecting bids. And then whatever they answer they give me, I go into my disarming statement of, okay, well, you know, in order for me to see if, if I really can help you at all, um, if it'd be okay with you, can I ask you some questions and we just have a conversation about what a possible solution even looks like? Okay. And how do they, how do they react to that? How does it, you said their body language changes. How does it change? Yeah. So they actually, they kind of, I, I get like, yeah, they go, yeah, that's, that's not a problem. And usually they either, you know, are kind of like this and their arms come unfolded yeah. or they have this confused look on their face. Like, why did he just ask me that? And then as we go through this process, you know, I can see where they're just kind of like, they don't kind of care. I'm just a salesman that walk through the door. But as I disarm them and start doing my process and questions, yeah. it, it turns into a conversation with yeah. somebody rather than just I'm across the table trying to sell them something. Yeah, you disarm them. So Correct. when they're disarmed, they open up. Correct. If you don't know how to disarm them because you haven't learned how to do that yet because you're not one of our clients, if your prospect stays, well, the wall up the whole time, well, guess what objection you're going to get most of the time then? I want to think it over. Give right. me some time. We'll get back to you if I'm interested. Hold on one second. My uh, my uh, video just went out. One second. 
Hey, Blake, my video just went out the camera. Well, hold on one second. Just lost video. Something just happened here. I'll keep talking. One second. Okay, uh, let's walk through now. All right, let me let me get Blake back in here. Video went out. Okay, we'll keep talking, but I think he's in the other room here. So, um, okay, so okay, so you notice how it disarms them, all right? Mm -hmm. So they typically open up. You can see by their body language. Um, mm -hmm. All right, now let's let's talk about situation questions. So before uh, before you learned NEPQ, how were you taught how to find out really what their current situation even was, and would they even tell you what their current situation was? Yeah. So with this one, um, you know, before I was taught in EPQ in my current job, you know, we yeah. had a process to where you just kind of you kind of just ask them, you know, what they have. You don't really ask them what they like or dislike about it. Um, you just kind of ask, have them go into like either the shower or the windows or something like that and just kind of ask what they're looking for. And you're really trying to kind of shoot in the dark and figure out what features or advantages that you can tie into. Okay, so you you basically been taught how to ask what's called consultative questions, right? Yeah. We call Correct. them surface level questions, Correct. where you're asking logical based questions, like what type of shower do you have, and they give you what in return. They're giving you logical based answers in return. <clears throat> now, what's the problem with that though? Do human beings make decisions on logic or emotion? Oh, emotion and then yeah, they emotion. the logic. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So if we only know how to ask logical based questions that, and they give us logical based answers in return, mm -hmm. then that's why we get so many objections at the end, because we were never able to go below the surface and really pull out their pain and their need. And, and really for a lot of people, sometimes it's even solving an emotional need, right? With what you do, see, see the difference there. It's still not working, Blake. I'm not sure it's going on. Uh, okay, so situation questions. Now, what, what's a good situation we've taught? Situation, but I'm not going to have you give them all your situation questions you've learned now, but what's one good situation question we've taught you that typically helps you really find out what's really going on? Um, for situation, I, I usually have three standard ones that I customize, you know, for depending on the call that I'm going on. Okay. Um, one of the best ones, it's pretty straightforward. It's just... Um, so, you know, so Mrs. Smith, um, how long have you seriously been wanting to change or how long have you been feeling like making this change? Okay. And what, what, what does that do? Why do you ask that question? What does it do? So when I ask that, I, the customer will tell me, oh, it's been, you know, three months, six months, a year. And when they say that out loud, it's building urgency with them and it's making them realize how long they've actually put this pro this project off. Yeah. Um, and so then I'll say, okay, that, that long or, um, and then they'll usually come up with a, you know, like a excuse like, oh yeah, I know it really needs to be done. I've just been putting it off or something like that. So it's one of my questions that helps build urgency throughout. Okay. The so it helps them see how long they've had the problem and basically uh, that nothing has ever changed because they haven't done, done anything about actually changing the problem. Basically, is that what Correct. it is? Correct. All right. Hold on one second. We're having camera issues when we start cam or yeah. get down there. There we go. Blake, you're the man. All right. So we got the camera back. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's right when he goes to the bathroom, the camera goes out. Uh, all right. This, I was like, where is Blake? What's going on? Uh, all right. Let's talk about problem awareness questions. Okay. So before, before you learned NEPQ, how did you even try to find out what their problems were or help them find out what the problems were? Because most of your prospects don't even realize they have a problem. Even if they have you come out to their house for an appointment, most mm -hmm. prospects don't realize they have a problem or they might realize they have a problem, but they don't realize how bad it really is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I will do the, what do you like and dislike, you know, and I'll work on my tonality. Like, what do you actually, you know, like about your current bump, you know, but beforehand um, it's really just kind of like generic surface level. Like, what are you looking for? Um, what problems are you having? You know, we, we try to get the, the, 
information out from the client, but you're still just getting those surface level, you know, problems or those surface level issues really. Yeah. All right. So what's one good problem awareness question you've learned now? Cause there's, there's multiple ones that we would use, especially with what you uh -huh. sell. What's one good problem awareness question that you're using now and uh -huh. why is it so effective? So there's, there's two. The first one I do is just the straightforward. What do you, what do you actually like about, you know, your current one, which by the time they call me out, they hate their scenario and they'll say, I don't like anything about it. And I go, Oh, okay. And I'll, I'll probe. The probing behind that is really what's get, get you the information. Can I help you with that question. If you're going to use that question, a better way to say it is you can say, and this is more in our inner circle stuff. You haven't gotten to that program yet, but you say now it can't. So Mrs. Johnson, it can't be all doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. what do you actually like about it and yeah. it kind of makes them crack up it's like a really good pattern up they're like and it causes yeah. them to trust you more now it can be all doom and gloom yeah. what do you actually like that'll yeah. look a little bit better there for sure yeah and i'll laugh or i'll make something like oh like really like there's gotta be something if you think about it and then then you know i won't necessarily feed them but i'll say okay well i'll rephrase it and be like what would be important for you to keep with a possible new solution? Okay. Like that. Yeah. All right. Perfect. You said you have another problem awareness question. What's that? Yeah. So with problem awareness, I'll ask them, um, we deal with a lot of issues like mold or, um, you know, it's installation processes, problems. I'll try to bring up things like what have you, what arrangements or what plans have you made for X, Y, Z problems? whether it's mold, whether it's something I can see that's a problem for cleaning, something that they've given me throughout the process already. And it helps them uh, figure out a problem that they didn't know they had ahead of time. Now, when you're, cause when you walk in, they kind of know with an inbound lead, they kind of know they have a problem. They don't know how bad that problem is. Correct. By that question that allows them to see that they have a second problem. Correct. What does that psychologically do in their mind? It they brew on it. Um, they'll ask me for a solution immediately, and I don't want to solve that solution right then. And I go, okay, and I'll I'll disarm or deflect and go, okay, well we can we can you know we can discuss that here in just a little bit. Yeah. And throughout the process, I can see the wheels turning where it's bothering them because now you look far more valuable in their mind because right. you've just helped them. It's problem finding, right? You've now helped them realize that they actually have two problems. And other salespeople trying to win that person, you know, trying to make that sale that you're competing with, I guarantee you wouldn't know how to do that because they're not our clients. They wouldn't have the skill sets to even know how to ask those questions. So now you're able to help them find two or three other problems they didn't realize they had, which sure. does what? It builds urgency in their mind that they need to do something about this now. Stop putting it down the road like they have been in the past. Right. What about solution awareness question? We don't have a lot of a time on that, but like what's one good solution awareness question we've taught you how to use? Um, so one of them would be where I say like, okay, so Mrs. Smith, other than, you know, changing your bathtub so that you can step over and you don't have to be, you know, in pain with your hips or backs, what, what other benefits are you really hoping to gain the most? Mm. And, and why do you ask that question? Because I want to get, if I've missed anything in my process, or I want them to really think about the solution and what their life would be like, or what they want to achieve by making this change. And another way you can relanguage that is you can say, so besides, and you repeat back what she said she wanted. So besides you just, yeah. you know, wanting to make sure that you, you don't slip and fall because you're right. on your own. Besides that, how do you see this, I guess, benefiting you the most? Right. Another way to relanguage that question you just asked. Um, all right. Uh, consequence. Why are consequence questions so important? So that makes them just think about the doom and gloom. And then if they don't actually do anything, that nothing is going to change. Help them find out what their current situation is. We call that their current state. Right. You build a gap in their mind from where they are compared to where they want to be. Sure. Okay, with your problem awareness in the first half of your solution awareness questions. Now we have to get them to see what their future is going to look like once all these newfound problems, your questions have helped them see they have or mm -hmm. actually solve. Like what, are, right. what does it look like once their future or their objectives are solved? We call that their objective state. So what's a good solution awareness question that we've taught you to use for that? 
Yeah. So when I when I do that, I will say something like it's right after I ask, well, why is this important now? Um, and then I'll follow it up with, well, if, if you had to think about it, I'm what what type of impact or what's the cost of doing nothing? You know, or what do they say when you say that? They'll they'll stop and kind of think, well, I don't know. Or like they'll they'll be confused. And I'll say, well, if you had to think about it um, and they'll say, well, if shoot, I've already put it off. Or I, if I don't do it now, then I'm going to have to live in pain or I'm going to have to, you know, nothing will change or the cost of goods will keep going up and I'll have to pay more later. Um, just something usually along those lines, especially with, you know, it's a time to, time to make a change. possible. Yeah. So it seems, yeah. Yeah. And, and one, you know, one way you could relanguage your consequence question where it hits even harder is you can say, okay, but help me understand. And you have to say this like in a skeptical yet your concern for them tone, like sure. empathy. So help, help me understand. So, so Sally, what, what happens though, if you, if you guys don't do anything about this, right. And then your husband's out of town on a, on his business trips and something happens to you where you, where you slip and fall, like what happens then? Or right. whatever they said their their concern was. Right. See, because that gets them to think, well, okay, but what are the ramifications if you guys don't do anything about this? And then your husband's out of town on another trip, and then something happens where you fall and you can't even get help. Like what happens then? See, it's like you're it's like this concerned tone that you have for them. Right. Really triggers them to be like, oh no, we've got to do something. And then you can say, okay, but why look at but hold on though. You've put this off in the past. Why uh -huh. look at doing this now uh -huh. rather than pushing it off down the road like a lot of people would that end up having some major issues? Right. See, that triggers me like, oh, the reason why we have to do it now is because of this, this, and this, which typically takes away that objection that a lot of people get was well, we need to keep looking around. We need to keep getting more quotes. We need to keep doing more research. If you ask those questions in that way, like we teach in our virtual training course, you're going to eliminate 80% of those. Yeah. Now tell me about this. When, once you've learned how to do that compared to how you used to sell, uh -huh. what, what do you think the percentages of objections you've eliminated compared to what you used to get? Um, quite a bit. Um, currently right now I'm closing between about 60 to 70% of the clients that I actually sit down and demo with. Um, and honestly, uh, objection handling is not even really my strong suit in the past. I, even with any PQ, I would revert, revert back to kind of hard closing type stuff. And I've learned to kind of go away from that, but I've been have blessed. You got, have you got the new product, the objection obliteration course? I don't think so on that you one. Want to message us in the DMs because it's a new product. We just came out. We just released it yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah. We released it two weeks ago. So it's a four-hour virtual training course just yeah. on the top 50 objections. Yeah. See, we've got any what any PQ allows me to do, even if I mess and up the, in the process. And all the word-for-word -word scripts. Yeah. So, I mean, even if I mess up in the process, honestly, the majority of sales I get are laydowns where I give out three options and they go, we'll go with this right here. But when I do have objections, um, you know, in the past, I just wouldn't be able to do it. I would try to reiterate the features and the benefits as opposed to going through and doing the clarified diffuse, you know, and discuss. Right. <laughs> that right there will probably make you instead of 60 percent up to 80 percent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good job, man. We're proud of you over here. Um, okay. So we don't have time to really go in through how we've taught you how to kind of restructure your presentation. That's, that's a little bit longer of, a, of an interview for that. Uh, commitment questions. How did you used to try to close before any PQ? What would you say in your old closing days? You know, I honestly, I don't really think that there was a whole lot of commitment statements at all. If we're being honest on it. Um, what would you, know, you say at the end? I mean, yeah, like it, it would be kind of like an option type close or would you like to do X, Y, Z or do X, Y, Z? You want the red one or the blue one? Exactly. Something like that. Or, you know, how about, how about we get, you know, get you written up today or get you set this out for delivery or how what about. What would we they typically say when you said that? They go, oh, you know, I think about an objection really is what comes out of that kind of yeah, 100%. stuff. 
Uh, what type of commitment? Just give them one example because there's multiple commitment questions, you know, that you're learning through the virtual training course and the group coaching. But what's one good commitment question we've taught you how to use? Um, so for commitment, I would say this is after I do like a presentation or throughout that process and be like, well, you know, does it seem like, you know, this is a good a good fit for you? Um, and then be like, you know, would this does this solution sound like it's the right one or right before I right before I roll out pricing, you know, I'll ask like, hey, you know, um, do you feel like this is the right solution? And then I'll be skeptical and ask them why after that as well. Yeah, it's, do, do you, do you uh, another way to relanguage that? So do you do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Don't right. say, and, and I know you're not doing it, but for everybody listen, never say do you think. Because oh right. Do you feel? Yeah. Think is logical. Feel is emotional. And it once right. again, human beings make buying decisions on emotion or logic. So that's why you never want to say think everybody. Do you do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Now, 99.9% .9 of people are going to say, yes, it is. Or they're going to say, yes, but, and they're going to tell you their concern. That's why it's so important to ask it that way. Okay. They're going to say, oh yeah, for sure. Or they're going to say, yeah, I really do. But we don't have the budget, but we got this. And they're going to tell you the real concern there. Okay. Now, since you've switched to just asking those type of commitment questions, what type of typical response do you get at the end? Um, when I, when I do that, they, if I've done the process correctly, they say with confidence, yes. Like, yeah. And then I'll ask, but, but why do you feel that way though? And then they'll reiterate, well, because this is going to do this for me. This is, has this, this has this. Um, and then I'll just kind of be like, okay, well, you know, that makes sense. And in order, and then I'll recap right before I roll out pricing, I'll recap. So in order for us to get you this X, Y, Z, so that you can do this, it's just going to be this. And then it's all, it's all sale from there. Yeah. hundred percent. I love it, dude. Hey, congratulations on your success. I always have to ask, I always ask every new client that we, we interview, I ask a client or two every single week. Uh -huh. uh, I know you're about to get married, right? I am. Is your fiance, is she, uh, is she happy that you got into the training? <laughs> she is uh, quite happy. She's, we're not used to the amount of income that's coming in and, uh, I remember having a phone call with her when I was on with Luke before I uh, joined saying, hey, hon, I'm going to spend X, Y, Z amount of money in this training and I'm going to put my all into it. And looking back, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Why do you think it is? Well, it, it's transformed my life. Uh, I've got a place where, you know, no matter what happens, I'm confident and I have the skills to provide for my family. Um, you know, take care of debt. I bought a new car. Now we're looking at, you know, a complete lifestyle change. It, it's a completely uh, change in your life for the best. So going from 80 to 90,000 a year to you're on pace to make, I think 340,000 this year. Correct. What's different besides buying a new house and a car? Oh, I mean, to, you know, being selfish, uh, a new truck and a bass boat, maybe in the future, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, truck and bass boat, I love it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, honestly, it, it's the security uh, behind providing for my new family, um, yeah. you know, and so just Could uh, you, do you feel like with what you're learning right now, uh -huh. let's say that your industry just, you know, let's say there's a great depression and nobody spends one dollar on home improvement, which we know is not realistic. Sure. Uh, but let's just say the industry you're in is gone right now. Could you take your skill level with NPQ and go to another industry and do exceptionally well? Oh, absolutely. What would be yeah. the reason, biggest reason why you think you could? Well, it's the fact that I've seen the way that this program works with with human emotion um, and the way just the success rate. I mean, it's the way that people open up to you and you can have people that are just, you know, kind of pushy or they're they care standoffish at first and then you go through this process and by the end of it they're writing you a fifteen thousand dollar check yeah not only are you making more sales but you i'm assuming are getting to buy more product correct so the, you're you're making uh, a higher um, what's it what's it called dpi dollar per lead right so right. instead of making it on average a six or seven or eight grand order you're now probably way higher than that which increases your commissions 
Yeah, I think my average is around 13 or 14. So every time I go out and work for about two hours or so, I make about, you know, $1,400 at least a day. It's not bad. A couple hours of work, 14, 1500 bucks. You'll take it, right? All right. Any last words of advice for anybody listening here that maybe is new to sales or maybe they're a vet and they're like, you know, should I get into the training? I don't know. Will it work for what I sell? Even though, yeah. we, even though uh, we train every industry in the world. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, honestly, I was skeptical too, Jeremy, when I saw this on here, but you, you've got to decide that you're going to invest in your future. Um, for me, doing that was a huge leap. I owe a big gratitude to my coworker and friend, Terry McCabe, who is also a client of yours. Uh, he collaborates and helps me with this. Um, but if you want to transform your life to people who are actually thinking about making this step, um, nothing's going to change if you, if you don't take that step. And I'm a living, breathing example of just an average guy that worked a nine to five, got tired of it and transformed my lifestyle. Yeah. All, all it takes are the right skills, right. right? Like everybody listening right now, all it takes are the right skills in the industry you're in right now. It's mm -hmm. not like Matt's industry is the only industry where our clients make 30 grand a month. We train in 158 different industries. Forbes, uh, Forbes magazine came out the other day and said there are 158 different industries with different subsets. We are in every single industry at this point. And I can pretty much guarantee everybody listening right now, we are training salespeople and companies in the same industry you're in right now. Same type of people you guys are right now listening to me that are out selling you two to three to four to five times. That means they're making two, three, four, five times the amount of commissions you make. And they are no different than you are. They brush their teeth. Uh, they eat breakfast like Matt does. They wear hats. They, they wear clothes. They Maybe they say their prayers at night. I mean, they are real people like you. The only difference is they've acquired the right skills. They've acquired the right knowledge. And then they went out and used those skills. That's available for everybody on here to get the same type of results that Matt has and thousands of our clients are getting. There's a reason why we have, I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's almost 7,000 testimonials now in the last 28 months, it's like 6,800 something. I lose, lose track. We have like another 10 or 15 every day at this point. So guys, if you want to learn those type of skills, you want to start making your first 10 grand a month in commissions with what you sell or 15 grand a month in commissions with your job right now, or maybe you want to make 20, 25, 30 plus, 40 plus a month like Matt is doing, in your industry right now, um, then just message me directly right now. Just message me on Facebook Messenger. If you're on our Facebook group, Sales Revolution, if you're on LinkedIn, you can message me directly. If you're on YouTube, I don't know what you guys have to do on YouTube. I, I don't think we can message you back. Uh, and if you can't figure that out, just post hashtag NEPQ in the comment section. So you can post hashtag NEPQ in the comment section, either myself Matt Ryder, our CEO, Marco Cortese, our CRO, or someone on my team, okay, because we have lots of people on the team at this point, will message you with some different training options. They'll even allow you to get on with a team member that can break down the different training programs depending on what you make now, what industry you're in, what type of commissions you're at now compared to what type of commissions you're wanting to make. Or if you're a sales manager or sales executive, let's say you've got 20, 30, 50 reps you're responsible for, or maybe you're a business owner, that has 3,000 salespeople. So we train okay. Fortune 500 all the way down to SMB, all the way down to individual salespeople selling anything at this point. And you want to scale your company, even if you're doing well. Let's say you're a seven figure company, you wanna to go to eight figures, or you're an eight figure company that wants to go to nine figures. All it takes are the right skills for your salespeople. So if you wanna learn those skills, post hashtag NEPQ, NEPQ in the comment section, either myself or someone on our team will message you back some details. Matt. Thanks for being on here. Enjoy Boise. You know, I spent four months of my life there. That's where I had my first sales job. The first four months of my career, I was shipped up there in a door-to-door -door summer program while I was going to school in Utah. So yeah. I lived up there from like April 28th to I think September 1st and was there in four months. It's actually a great city. It is. It is. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. Have a good day. All right, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks for being on. I'll see everybody next week in the corporate office. I'll be back in Scottsdale next week. I, I traveled out the last three weeks. Thanks, Matt, for being on here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.